your voice, your future. The race for West Virginia's chief legal officer. Speaking for legal interests of the state, putting the public benefit first. Former U.S. Attorney and current State Senator Mike Stewart and State Auditor J.B. McCuskey battle for the Republican nomination for Attorney General. I've had great titles. I'm not running for a title. I'm running to do the job of Attorney General and protect the people of West Virginia. I am the only candidate in this race who understands how the bureaucracy works from soup to nuts and will be able to stand side by side with the next Republican governor as we reform our government. They take the stage at West Virginia State University for a debate in our Eyewitness News Town Hall discussion, sponsored by Council Connections. Good evening, West Virginia. My name is Julian Pecora, the founder of Council Connections, tonight's organizers and sponsors of the sole Republican Attorney General debate in West Virginia. Tonight is a great honor for us. Some of you at home might be asking, what is Council Connections? Council Connections is a group dedicated to retaining talent in West Virginia, building a better community, and increasing civil engagement in our great state. Tonight, we thank the audience. We thank the two candidates for agreeing to do this, and especially to West Virginia State University for agreeing to host this debate. On May 1st, early voting begins, and on May 14th, West Virginians will have the opportunity to have their voices heard. One of the races up for grabs is the Attorney General in West Virginia. Tonight, we hope it is informative and educational for you, and we hope that you go to the polls. I turn it over to our moderator tonight, Mr. Kenny Bass. Thank you, Julian, very much. Welcome. We're glad you're here at the Davis Fine Arts Building. Thank you to West Virginia State University for hosting this debate. There's nothing more important than an election for free and fair debate, and I'm hopeful we have one of those tonight. I want to thank our candidates for stopping by and giving us a part of their evening. We appreciate it. Of course, we have West Virginia State Auditor J.B. McCuskey and former U.S. Attorney and current State Senator Mike Stewart. There was a coin toss earlier to determine the order of how we're going to get started, and the auditor called Tales Never Fails, and he was correct. He will start our proceedings with an opening statement, which will allow Mr. Stewart to have the final word in our closing remarks. Mr. McCuskey. Kenny, thank you so much. And, and to Julian and to everyone at Council Connections and everyone here at Fairmont State, thank you so much for hosting. My name is J.B. McCuskey, and I am a Christian. I'm a husband. I'm a father. I'm a small business owner. And for the last eight, nine years of my life, I've committed myself to the public service of the people of West Virginia. And tonight, I'm going to talk a little bit about why I've committed myself to the people of West Virginia. And the reason is, is because I know that greatness is within our grasp. And nothing has ever been more important to me than making sure that every single West Virginian has the best opportunity at a great life possible. We know that there are forces trying to stop that from either in West Virginia or outside of West Virginia. And I'm very, very hopeful as Attorney General that I'm going to be able to fight back against people that don't trust our way of life. You're going to hear a little bit about my record as the state auditor, the big wins that we've had reforming our bureaucracy, the big wins that we've had making government more efficient and smaller, and the big wins that we've had making our state work better for the people of West Virginia. You're also going to hear a little bit about how I've been part of an incredible Republican revolution that has changed the way that the rest of the world looks at West Virginia. And I cannot wait to talk about my record uh, and what I plan to do to make West Virginia the greatest place in this country, the exact moniker we know that it should have. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. McCaskey. <laughs> Mr. Stewart. Thank you, Kenny, and thank you, Auditor, uh, for being here this evening. This is a tremendous honor, and i got to tell you that uh, I want to thank Council of Connections, WCHS, West Virginia State University, of course, for hosting this debate. We have too little debate when it comes to running for public office. I think it's critically important we have more forums for the public like this. Listen, as a little boy, I could have never dreamt that I'd be able to stand at a podium like this to be able to debate for the office of attorney general. It was a dream too big for me to dream as a boy. My dad, 51-year coal miner, my grandfather's coal miners. Gosh, I'm proud of that heritage. I'm proud of my 30-year marriage to my wife, uh, Katrina, who's here this evening. Proud of uh, my two daughters, one who graduated from college last year, one who will graduate from college this year. 
And the one who graduated last year goes to Marshall's Med School this year. So I'm just, I couldn't be more thrilled. I'm thrilled and pleased and honored with my record I've had working with President Trump to try to turn West Virginia around, to be able to fight those issues that mean so much. I've not only worked for him once at his request, but twice. I ran his campaign in West Virginia in 2016, and after we won, I was asked to become the United States Attorney, and we had a pretty good record. Prosecuted two members of the state Supreme Court for the first time in history. Largest Medicaid fraud takedown in the history of West Virginia, largest drug raid in the history of West Virginia, and took enough fentanyl off the streets to kill more than 40 million people. I'm incredibly honored to be here. The real opponent that should be on the stage, though, is Joe Biden and the Biden administration, who is assaulting our way of life on a daily basis. You know, we had that, uh, uh, that big event today, but I can tell you that uh, what I'd really like to be able to do is darken the skies that Joe Biden has brought for good. And so I appreciate being here. I look forward to the discussion, and, uh, and I appreciate it very much. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Stewart. We'll get started with the first question for Mr. McCuskey. The opioid crisis, of course, continues to hit West Virginia very hard. What still needs to be done in the battle against opioids, and how can the attorney general be most effective in that fight? Sure. So the first thing that needs to be done, and I talk about this a lot um, when I'm working with local governments, is that we cannot allow the next 20 years to proceed the same way that the last 20 years have proceeded. Our number one goal has to make sure that we have less children that get addicted to these awful poisons. And I am so excited that we have almost a billion dollars at our disposal through the West Virginia First Foundation. And we have appointed this wonderful man named Jonathan Board to help us to help us run that foundation. And so what we have to do is we have to say, no more drugs for kids. Our children have to absolutely 100 percent come first. I want to make sure that everybody that suffers from substance abuse disorder has every resource they need to get better. But at the end of the day, if we are having the same conversation at the same podium in 20 years, we have failed. And we cannot allow that to happen. And so as the state auditor, I have spent an enormous amount of time working with local governments, advising them on how they're allowed to spend this money, giving them the resources they need to spend it properly. And I'm incredibly excited um, about the opportunities that we have going forward, allowing our local governments to do what they need to do, but more importantly, guiding this foundation in a way that um, enables it to accomplish that important goal. And, and I would be remiss if I didn't mention my great friend Josh Barker, who's in the back here. Josh is one of my longest term friends, and Josh is like so many people. He's a wonderful husband and a wonderful father, and he was an incredible employee, he is an incredible employee. But Josh fell victim to this, this scourge. And I remember the night when Josh's mom, or Josh's wife, called me, and she said, Josh overdosed. And I said to her, I said, you need to get Josh all the help he needs, and his job will be waiting here for him when he gets back. And Josh has been sober for about 18 months now, and he's one of the greatest stories and one of my greatest friends. And when I think about my life and the struggles that I've been through, I, I think about Josh often, um, because I know that getting past things that are hard in life is possible, and Josh is the exact story of the, the exact person who didn't see it coming, and we needed to just give him a little tiny bit of a hand up. And I'm just so proud of Josh, and I'm so excited for our future in West Virginia because I you, think sir. we have a real chance. Thank yes, you. Sir. Mr. Stewart. Great. Thank you. The, the opioid scourge is the greatest scourge, the greatest challenge, perhaps, of our time. You know, I celebrate the story you just shared with us, the story of recovery and redemption, second chances. You know, the fact of the matter is we lose more people. We've lost over the past two years more people to the opioid scourge than we lost in the entirety of the Vietnam War. The numbers are staggering. I carry a wallet in my pocket every day from the victims of the opioid crisis while I was U.S. Attorney. Those pictures mean a lot to me. Those parents that I got to meet through chaos and misery and despair. We have to meet the challenge of this great challenge of our times. The first foundation is going to be a big step in that direction. Ultimately, it'll be almost a billion dollars that we get to use to help solve this crisis. But I think it's important the Attorney General be engaged on the front lines. And I spent years working on the front lines of this crisis. I think it's important the next Attorney General be somebody who has worked those front lines, that has been with law enforcement as we've knocked down those doors, that has treated, that has gone to treatment centers and recovery centers. It's critically important. But the first foundation, there are some concerns. 
and some of those first distributions that went to counties all across West Virginia. Many of those dollars went to pay legacy jail bills. My concern is this, and the next attorney needs to make sure that this isn't the case. If we spend that once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to try to deal with the opioid crisis, and we waste it away like we have so many challenges in our past, we will end up with an opioid crisis at the end of our days. We have to meet this head on. It is my top priority to continue the work I did as U.S. Attorney, but to do so leading this effort for West Virginia. Mr. Stewart, thank you. I'll ask you this uh, question. You'll start this time. Many calls we receive from viewers at the station, they concern problems they're having with companies they've done business with. And what do you think is the main function of the Attorney General's Consumer Protection Division, and what would you do to beef that up if it needs to be beefed up in order to deal with consumer problems? Yeah, so I think it's an incredibly important question. You know, consumers today, they're dealing with the challenges of inflation and higher prices, higher utility rates. They're not sure exactly where the line is on their property. They've got challenges when they go to the store and they don't get the right answer. But they ought to be able to call the Attorney General's office and be worked through a process so that they feel like a customer who's going to get follow-up from the Attorney General. It's one of the most important things an attorney general does, is that consumer protection side. Because an ordinary consumer, it's really important to them that they have someone they can depend on, that will fight for them as they're out in the community. They see these challenges, the attorney general needs to be on top of it. So there's no question as attorney general will beef up that function of consumer protection, will assign more bodies to that work. But I'll pay personal attention to this work as well. Mr. Yeah, I, I think General Morrissey has actually done a really great job at this. But I think the crux of this issue comes down to um, a lawyer being able to determine who is a bad actor and who is an actor that's made a mistake. And we have a business community in West Virginia that is second to none. And we have businesses everywhere that occasionally something bad happens. And the attorney general has to be able to make the distinction between what is a bad company that you really need to hammer, and what is a great company that's made a, a little bit of a mistake. Uh, make sure you're taking care of the consumers always, but the, the distinction between what, are, what is a really, really good business who's a great partner in the community and does everything the right way, and a partner and a, and a business who is here to, to prey on and to, to really harm our, our constituents and our taxpayers, that's a distinction that's really important to be made, and, and I feel really great about my ability and, and the team that I'm going to build's ability to, to, to make that distinction and fight the fights that need really fought. Mm -hmm. Mr. McCuskey, one of the main powers of the Attorney General, of course, is to deal with the federal government in court. What do you see the main role of the office is in pretending to orders and directions from the federal government which would directly impact West Virginia citizens and businesses? You know, orders from the administration, orders from agencies which answer to the administration. Yeah, so what we see right now is that the world is looking at West Virginia. For the first time in my life, we are cutting ribbons at a pace that is, um, it's, it is so fast we can barely keep up with it. The world is saying, West Virginia, what about you? Why is my, is my business not here? And this has created this incredible opportunity for us to finally achieve this greatness that I talked about in my opening. And our greatest impediment to that growth and to that incredible greatness right now is the Biden administration, as Senator Stewart just said. We have people in New York and California and Washington, D.C. who don't want us to mine. They don't want us to frack. They don't want us to timber. They don't want us to farm. They want us to do. They don't want us to be successful. And our economy is driven by those things. The men and women of those industries are the most important cogs of our entire economy. So we have to allow West Virginians to build our economy the West Virginia way. And I know that I am going to build a team of people who can fight hard exactly the same way is happening now in, in the EPA case, right, for example. But what's happening now is that the federal government has gotten very, very smart. And they know they can't use the big industries. They're using things like fish and wildlife. Most people don't know this, but the Nucor steel plant has been delayed by months because of river mussels. I've never personally eaten a river mussel. Uh, I'm not even sure you can eat one. But I know for a fact that it's costing uh, one of our state's largest and most important economic development opportunities, hundreds of millions of dollars, and it's delaying great jobs for great men and women uh, all up and down the Ohio River. Mr. Stewart. Yeah, so this is, this is a tremendous challenge, and certainly as a former United States attorney working in the federal courts on a daily basis, these challenges of working in the federal courts, pushing back against federal overreach, using those federal courts 
be able to fight and defend the people of West Virginia. It's critically important, and we can't, we, we can't afford delays in that process. Uh, I've got to tell you, last week I was at Cleveland Cliffs up in Weirton. Cleveland Cliffs, it's, it's an employer of great jobs. 900 jobs are going to be lost this month in Weirton. As a result of what? The Biden administration refusing to step in and stop tin dumping from the Chinese and other countries here in this country. Cleveland Cliffs simply couldn't compete. We have to have an attorney general who's prepared to walk into the federal courts to seek those injunctions to fight back. It's not just Cleveland Cliffs. It's not just Nucor. It's the Second Amendment. It's our gender issues and, and the gender discussion that we see all the time, whether little boys can play little girls' sports. They've moved into every element of our life, whether it's drilling, fracking, and mining, you name it, they're there. And we have to fight back with ferocity. And we've got to build a team that's able to do that quickly, efficiently, with a record of winning. I've done that before. The Second Amendment is an area that is under direct assault from this administration. I think it's important you know the record of both of us on the Second Amendment, so you can make a judgment as to who's going to be best to defend that. But all these issues, the Biden administration has to go. And if there's any chance whatsoever President Biden wins re-election, I think it's even more important I'd be in that spot where I can be there to aggressively defend the people of West Virginia. But we've got to elect President Trump, but we have to be prepared for either, either option that happens in November. Thank you, Mr. Stewart. A question for you, sir. The, let's say the federal government puts out a mandatory vaccine order for citizens all across the United States with very limited exemptions to that order. How would your office respond to such a mandate and what exemptions, if any, should be considered for something like that in this hypothetical situation? Well, I think, I think it's real clear. My, my view on this, and I think it's important as we give answers this evening, we not give political speak. I, I support vaccine freedom. You know, there are 45 states in the country that have vaccine freedom. 45. There are 15 states that not only have religious freedom, they have philosophical freedom. We passed a bill in the legislature this year, a very, very small bill, that would have granted vaccine freedom to students in public virtual schools. Think about that, public virtual schools. It's Johnny sitting in his room doing public school. We would have allowed private schools to make their own determination on whether they change their vaccine requirements. Unfortunately, that bill was vetoed. I get along with the governor just fine, and I support many of the things he's done. I disagree with him on this particular issue, but this is going to come up again. We have to be prepared to step into the federal courts. It's, a, it's going to be a recurring theme of mine, is we got to be prepared to step into the federal courts to fight for West Virginians. All of our freedoms, whether it's vaccine freedom, religious freedom, the freedom to own and uh, keep and bear arms, whether it's the freedom to drill, frack, and mine. There's a common theme that I've had throughout this campaign, and it's why I'm running for attorney general. I think it's critically important. But on the issue of vaccine freedom, I support it. I think it's important that parents, parents have priority when it comes to their children. Mr. Bukowski. Yeah, the federal government is never going to tell us what to do under my watch, full stop. Um, and I started my legal career at a place called the American Center for Law and Justice. I was really blessed to be able to work for a guy named Jay Sekulow, who's the leading religious freedom lawyer in America. He also happens to be President Trump's personal lawyer. I was, I was, it was an amazing experience to, to work with somebody who is the actual expert on this issue. And, and Mike's right, parents need to have choices, but we also have to listen to experts. And on this particular issue, um, I'm not a doctor, I'm not a nurse, I'm not a healthcare professional, but what I know is, is that Governor Justice supports religious freedom as much as any person I've ever met, and the medical professionals that are surrounding him that are the best in the world, they didn't think this was the right time for that bill. And I think one of the things that was playing into that is that we have a border crisis in America. We have people flooding this country from all over the world, and when there is no vaccinations anywhere. We have measles outbreaks and mumps outbreaks all over this country, and it's possible that this wasn't the right time to do something like that. But at the end of the day, it's always a balancing act. People's religious freedoms are wildly and completely important, and they're also probably go a little further than, than, than what would be a vaccine mandate, but we have to be listening to our medical professionals because they are the true experts when it comes to how do we achieve health 
for uh, a giant population. Listen, I think I need to follow up on this, though, right? I mean, he voted against, he talks about religious freedom, but he voted against the Religious Freedom Restoration Act when you were a member of the legislature. It's one thing to give an answer. It's another to play political speak. Your record isn't consistent Mr. with Mr. McCuskey, you, just you said. can respond to that? Sure. So I, do I don't Mr. Stewart, please. I don't I don't believe that we need to codify anything that's in our constitution. And what we found is is that the United States Supreme Court just very recently figured it out. And we now live in a country where no one is forced religiously to do anything that they don't want to do. The Supreme Court got it right because they are the proper people to be interpreting the Constitution of the United States. Thank you. Thank you. Matt, I need the audience to stay in your seats and stay calm. I appreciate that very much. Another question for you, Mr. McCuskey. The Biden administration has laid out pretty clear their mandates when talking about transgender individuals. I think the Biden administration has been clear in its policies and its directions and in remarks the president himself has made. In relation to West Virginia, what would you do, what could you do as attorney general to protect the rights of those who identify as transgender and also protecting the rights of the girls and the women who, say, play sports in West Virginia and use those locker room facilities? Go. Yeah, at the end of the day, boys should never be in girls' locker rooms. And I have a nine-year-old daughter who is, I'm blessed to say, a very, very good soccer player. And I cannot imagine, and I will not allow a world to exist where she has to play against biological men in sports. It's crazy. It makes absolutely no sense. It's dangerous. And if I'm being fair, it doesn't make any sense from a competition standpoint. That doesn't mean that you have to be rude or hateful or angry towards anybody. Every single human being deserves dignity and respect. My faith tells me that. I love every single human being in this world, right? But we, we cannot allow that specific Christian ideal to prevent us from doing what is right. And what is right is boys are boys, girls are girls. And girls play sports against girls, and we should absolutely never have people of the male gender being in the same locker room as a girl. It's crazy. Mr. Stewart. Yeah, I've been real clear on this as well. Boys are boys. Girls are girls. There's no confusion as to where that pendulum should swing. And we should, certainly should push back when it comes to gender reassignment for children. You know, right now in the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals, an argument's been made, and we're waiting to get that opinion back from the Fourth Circuit. It's on West Virginia's law that prohibits uh, transgender boys from competing in girls' sports. And I think it's likely we get an adverse ruling in that case. The next attorney general, and it's likely to be one of the two of us, will be in the United States Supreme Court to argue this case. It's a critically important case. We, we shouldn't have political speak on this. I like my opponent. We've been friends for a very long time, but I think it's important. He's been a sponsor of Fairness West Virginia. You've taken full maximum contributions from Stephen Skinner, the founder of that organization. Their agenda is primarily the transgender uh, agenda, which has hit our schools and hit our families and hit our values in a tough way. I, I will waive time for him to explain this because his answer, again, it doesn't speak to uh, his actions in terms of being a sponsor of this organization. You don't have to waive time. The way the debate will go is if you open something like that up with a, with an accusation or a statement, then I'll certainly allow a response. But I appreciate that. But Mr. McCuskey can respond directly. Yeah. So. As it relates to, to Stephen Skinner, uh, he is a very well-respected and a really great member of the state bar in West Virginia. And he looked at the two of us and he said, I respect his legal ability more than yours. And he decided to give me some money. I don't think it has absolutely anything to do with his sexuality or the fact that he had anything to do with Fairness West Virginia. And if, and if, if I may, <laughs> The, the, the contribution that you continue to talk about to Fairness West Virginia, my wife and I, I really appreciate you bringing this up because it gives me a chance to talk about how amazing my wife is. My wife, Wendy, is sitting here, and, and we own the, the largest women's clothing store in West Virginia. And she is the best wife and the best mother and the best friend, and she's the most conservative person I think I've ever met. I can tell you, you're lucky she's not standing here. <laughs> but when you have a business like that, and, and to be fair, you know, this is her life, right? We sponsored a scholarship fund for at-risk children. It happened to maybe have something to do with fairness, but at the end of the day, children that are suffering is something that I'm always going to support my wife in her endeavors to make her business stronger and to, and to help out her friends who may or may not disagree with you. Thank you. 
I have to ask the audience again, I appreciate your enthusiasm. When somebody's here for somebody, we get it. But it's unfair if you have, have applause or booing or whatever. It's not asking a whole lot not to respond during the answer. Can you do that for me? That would be much appreciated by both candidates, I think. We're glad you're here. But silently cheer inside of your head. That would be helpful. Thank you. Mr. Stewart, last week the Mango County Sheriff's Deputy Association announced it was rescinding its endorsement of you based on statements that you made regarding the death of uh, State Police Sergeant Corey Maynard, that tragic murder. Maynard's widow said she had asked you to stop speaking publicly about the case out of the trial. I, to, to be fair, in context, your remarks were in, in relation to you were pushing for the death penalty bill in the state senate in your remarks. Uh, she also said, though, his widow said she was blocked from your campaign page after posting critical comments. So without getting into the context of the contents themselves, the comments themselves, unless you want to, I want to ask a First Amendment question. What's your response to have expressed this as a violation of her First Amendment to respond to you? And would you take similar action of blocking constituents if you were elected to the office of Attorney General? Wow, so there's a lot in that question. Yes, sir. I, I am so glad you asked that question. And listen, my heart goes out to Rachel Maynard and uh, that tragedy that befell her family and Corey Maynard and her and her children. Uh, it's, it's tough, and it's tough to talk about these issues. You know, I've talked about the death penalty for a number of years. This particular case that happened on Thursday night, you know, as U.S. Attorney, I prosecuted a lot of corruption. But clearly, I didn't prosecute enough corruption in places like Mingo County. This was a fake endorsement issued at about 5 o'clock so that they could rescind the endorsement. They issued it with a whisper. They rescinded it with a bullhorn. And it's tragic. The media didn't report any of those facts. The media didn't get into the details as to how this thing was concocted. This group didn't endorse President Trump. They didn't endorse any other candidate on a statewide basis. But the media ran with it. And frankly, the media, we understand, on a national level can be fake. We expect more on a local level. And here, I don't think the media did their work. My heart breaks for Rachel Maynard. It's terrible. I do believe that the death penalty should be on the table if you kill a first responder in the line of duty. And it's not new that I've talked about this. I introduced the bill last year. I introduced the bill this year. Patrolman Cassie Johnson, Sheriff's Deputy Baker, what happened to Trooper uh, Abe Bean up in Martinsburg. These are tragedies. We've got to get tougher on these crimes. But my heart breaks for what Rachel Maynard's going through. I don't want it to happen to any other family. My apologies to her if she feels as though I've stepped across the line. But when I spoke on this case, I spoke in terms of all these cases. I think it's important we have these discussions because I think it's something the people of West Virginia want. And I know law enforcement officers across West Virginia want as well. So quick, thank you. Quick follow-up, though, uh, sure. the issue of blocking her from your campaign site, would you continue that practice as AG? No, so listen, I think it's fair to have these discussions and I think it's important that everybody get free speech. I understood that she was upset. I offered to meet with her and I continue to want to meet with her. I feel horrible about what happened. Uh, but as a state senator, it's my responsibility to talk about public policy issues that are sometimes incredibly uncomfortable I represent all the members of my district, but I also think I'm a representative of the people of West Virginia. Tough on crime is something we have to do. We have to push forward on these issues. And across our country, law enforcement officers are being sieged with criminal acts. We just saw where President Trump was at the funeral of a slain officer just last week. We didn't see any accusations that he was playing politics. We've got to get tougher on these issues. Thank you, Mr. McCuskey. Yeah, so to your first question, uh, I don't believe in blocking people on social media, especially when you're a public figure. If you're, if you're going to step in the kitchen, sometimes you've got to take a little bit of heat. Um, Mr. Stewart, though, answered a wide-ranging answer, though. With the sure, and I'm just going to keep going there. I'm, I'm, um, continue, sir. The, the second thing I would say is that um, I am the candidate in this race who has law enforcement support. Uh, I am very, very proud to have been endorsed by the, the West Virginia Sheriff's Association. I, I, I find it a little off-putting that my opponent is blaming the deputy sheriffs of Mingo County for playing politics. They left your endorsement up for an entire day. I believe it is still up as we speak. 
Um, and as it relates to, to Rachel Maynard, I've known about this quarrel that you guys were having for months. And out of respect to her, I very intentionally didn't politicize it. And, and Rachel has reached out to me recently, and, and I've gotten to speak with her. And, and I don't believe that she thinks you apologized to her. I believe that she thinks that you used her husband's death and probably violated multiple parts of our state's ethics rules in trying to promote a bill that I actually support. The bill is a good bill. We should absolutely have the death penalty on the table for anyone that kills a first responder. But there were so many other ways that you could have done it without absolutely breaking open a wound that didn't need to be reopened and without describing something that wasn't public and without probably, well not probably, violating the ethics that a prosecutor should have known. And for me, your apology today rings a little tiny bit hollow because she asked you for that apology a long time ago and at every turn, according to her, your apology was about yourself. And I'm not gonna sit here and let you disparage the sheriff's deputies in Mingo County and I'm not gonna sit here and let you claim that, that you apologized to her because you just did it today because there's cameras on. Thank you, Mr. McCuskey. I'll let you respond to that, Mr. Stewart. It's playing politics on this issue and it's unfortunate, but that's exactly what happened from Mingo County last week. They were playing politics with this issue. It's unfortunate. Listen, anybody who knows me and knows my career over the long period of time that I've worked with law enforcement knows my sincerity on these issues. When I spoke on this subject repeatedly, it was in uh, groupings of terrible events that happened to multiple people. I think it's important we have this discussion, but the idea that I was playing politics with it is brutally offensive. It's outrageous for you to play politics with this issue as the Mingo County uh, players did last week. Thank you, sir. Mr. McCuskey, the Office of Attorney General is not like uh, every other member of the Board of Public Works. It's a little bit different, at least from my amateur take on it. And should the Attorney General take a very active stance in West Virginia and federal politics, or should the office be more of a defender against unwanted and onerous intrusions on the rights of West Virginians, or is it a mix of both? It's absolutely both, Kenny. Um, at the end of the day, the Attorney General is the, it is the rear guard of American politics. The, the Republican Attorneys Generals of this country are the, the, the final line of defense against incredible federal overreach. And it is unfortunate and fortunate that West Virginia is the, the, the center of that battlefield, right? We are a state that makes, that makes its living uh, by taking things out of the ground and burning them to make electricity. That's who we are. We have built this country. We made the steel that made the ships that won World War II, right? That's who we are. We are the hardest working, greatest people in the history of this country. And the, the, the attorneys generals, especially the Republican attorneys generals, are the absolute tip of the spear when the federal government goes too far to say, no, that's not going to happen here, and it's not going to happen anywhere else where people are similarly situated. And what I know is, is that our greatest asset is the people that are sitting right here in front of me and the people that are watching this, right? People are going to move to West Virginia, not because of our coal, not because of our gas, but because of our values, right? This is a place where you can drop your kid off at your neighbor's house if you got to go to a debate. This is a place where you can, you know, you can, you can walk to church, you can walk to school, and you're surrounded by a community and a family of people that matter to you and you matter to them. And so in order for us to grow, we have to defend who we are as human beings. And what we are, I believe, is the greatest set of human beings probably in this country's history. And I cannot wait to go to the federal courts and tell Joe Biden, no, that is not how this works. And it's definitely not how it works in West by God, Virginia. Mr. Stewart. Well, that sounds good. I was picked by President Trump to be the U.S. attorney here because of my record of fighting. And my record of fighting was real clear in the federal courts while I was U.S. attorney to work on his behalf. You know, the issue of the Second Amendment is one of those federal overreach issues. And I hear my opponent say he strongly supports the Second Amendment, but he voted once, not once, not twice, not three times, four times against the Second Amendment. This is just a fact. He voted against constitutional concealed carry over and over and over again. The Biden administration has recently put out an eight-page memo that's gone to states to be able to help them overturn the Second Amendment. 
They use terms like gun safety instead of words like gun control. This is just one example. These are critically important issues. You need to make darn sure where your next attorney general, attorney general stands on these issues. So yes, I'm excited about the ability to go back and punch at the federal government. Certainly, if President Biden, my goodness, happens to get a, uh, another term, that's why we have to be knocking on doors, working as hard as we can to support President Trump's reelection. We need to be knocking on doors till our knuckles are bloody. It's that important. Every value we value as a state, as we, we value as a people, is being sold down the yard by the Biden administration. We've never seen anything like it, whether it's drilling, fracking, mining, the Second Amendment, a host of other issues. But I look forward to this challenge. I look forward to working in those courts, and I have a pretty strong record in that regard. Mr. McCaskey, would you respond to the, the, the comment about the, your votes on the Second Amendment? Yeah, so what I would say is, is that, uh, that I have an A rating from the NRA, and that is what is true today. And I would say that on this issue, uh, Senator Stewart's probably a little bit of an unreliable witness. And uh, I am certainly very proud of the fact that the National Rifle Association trusts me to defend the Second Amendment for the people of the state of West Virginia, and I will do everything in my power to make sure that we are doing just that. Thank you, Mr. Stu but yes, that's sir. only half the story. He's got a C rating with the Citizens Defense League, who endorsed me for Attorney General. I think it's important. You know, the CDL is West Virginia's largest grassroots organization in support of the Second Amendment. I appreciate and I acknowledge that he was given an A rating by the NRA, as was I. But the CDL, West Virginia's largest grassroots firearms organization, supports Stewart for attorney general. Why? Because they know that when it comes tough times, Stewart's going to fight for the Second Amendment and make sure I fight for everybody out there Thank you. to be able to keep them bare arms. Thank you. Mr. Stewart, West Virginia's attorney general has very few powers related to criminal cases and prosecutions that some other attorneys general across the country have. As a state senator, you've advocated for... Uh, the death penalty, of course, from uh, the conviction of a murderer of a first responder. Should the Attorney General of West Virginia be granted more power in the criminal arena through a constitutional amendment, or does the office already have all the tools it needs to be productive and successful? Well, I don't believe we'd need a constitutional amendment. There have been some proposals in the legislature as recently as this year to extend criminal authority to the Attorney General, but I will leave that to the legislature and our next governor to make a determination of. I'm prepared to do that if that's the direction they go. But I will say this, that there's plenty of work for the next attorney general in terms of federal overreach to be able to look at issues like corruption, to prosecute Medicaid fraud. And we will be looking at issues like corruption and referring those to local prosecutors for prosecution. But I'll leave the issue as to whether there's criminal authority expanded beyond what they have today, which is in criminal appeals. I'll leave it to the next legislature and governor to determine. Mr. McCuskey? Yeah, I'm a small government uh, guy, and, and I truly believe that our county prosecutors do a phenomenal job. And as the state auditor, we created the Public Integrity and Fraud Unit. Um, and in the last six years since we established uh, the unit, we have convicted 47 people of felony fraud. Um, and we are really, really proud of the relationship that we have built with our local prosecutors. And, and what I know is, is that that is a, it's a group of people who are truly fantastic at being lawyers and they understand their local communities and every single one of these cases happens in a local community and that lawyer is going to have to understand who, where they are, what the grand jury is going to do and I, I am more than happy and would probably oppose uh, ever um, aggregating that level of power into Charleston and away from places like Martinsburg and, and, uh, and Wood County and, and Wheeling. I believe that, that Charleston needs to sort of be hands off and I'll tell you what's really phenomenal is just today um, I had prosecutors lining up to, uh, to endorse me, and we released a letter with prosecutors from all across West Virginia who have all uh, signed up to be prosecutors for McCuskey, and I'm really, really excited about uh, traveling the state with these guys because they know uh, who's the person who's going to be the best in court. Gentlemen, we've reached the point of the program where it's time for your final statements. Uh, Mr. Stewart will go last to get the final word. Mr. McCuskey, you opened our debate. Will you please open our closing statements? So I'm really, really thankful for the opportunity to be here. And Mike, I'm thankful to be, to be standing next to you as well. I love West Virginia more than I love anything in this world but God and my family. And I have spent the better part of my adult life doing every single thing that I can for the people of this state to achieve greatness. 
And the opportunity to be the Attorney General for the state of West Virginia is an overwhelming honor. It's an honor that I am fully prepared to execute. And I will tell you that greatness is truly within our grasp. And what I was saying earlier, this is the most important thing that we all need to know. And that is that the people of West Virginia, who we are, how we live, and what we are is the most important asset that our economic development team in West Virginia will ever have. And we will not reach our potential. We will not reach that greatness if we allow the rest of the world to tell us we're not good enough for another 10 years. We are good enough. We are absolutely better than good enough. And we deserve all the greatness that we are getting ready to achieve. And we are getting ready to, to show the rest of the world what it means to be a mountaineer and welcome mountaineers from around this country who want to live in freedom and freedom's last outpost. Mr. Stewart. Great, thank you very much. I, I share Auditor McCuskey's passion for West Virginia. My goodness, my upbringing, it would be hard not to share that. I'm the most likely of guys to ever be on a stage. I've never even done anything like this before and those bright lights that shine down upon you. Listen, this comes down to a very important question and very clear distinction. I have a record of being a conservative, a conservative fighter, and my record is big as U.S. Attorney, and uh, in the state Senate, I've had a good, strong record on conservative ideals. My opponent, uh, while I like him, he's a left of center candidate. And he has been supported by the establishment in a way that certainly my campaign is not. I'll be outspent in this campaign 10, 12, 15, 20 to 1. It's a grassroots campaign of ordinary West Virginians from all across this state that are joined together. I've been endorsed by the West Virginia Coal Association, the Citizens Defense League, the Family Policy Council, West Virginia auto dealers who are fighting those onerous standards of the EV standards coming from this administration. I've been endorsed by two veterans groups. We're going to continue to fight. That's my record as a fighter. I've always been the underdog. I've always been counted out. But we've always found a way to win. I give you my word on this, regardless of who wins this race, I will support the Republican for Attorney General for the state of West Virginia in this general election. It's critically important. But I urge you to look at voting records, know who you're voting for. You need a Trump Republican who's going to fight with President Trump for an America first agenda. That's exactly what I intend to do. And that's what I've done through the course of my career working with President Trump. So thank you very much for the honor of being here. Thank you, Auditor McCuskey, for the evening. And thank all of you for being here as well. Mr. Stewart, Mr. McCuskey, ladies and gentlemen, now would be a great time for applause. Thank you for recognizing both of our candidates. Gentlemen, thank you very much for your time. We appreciate it. Don't forget, early voting in West Virginia starts May 1st. The election is Tuesday, May 14th. Go out and vote, no matter whom you're voting for. Thank you to Council Connections for sponsoring this event. For Eyewitness News, I'm Kenny Bass. Have a great evening.